and a small one. Uh, so we've got 60 minutes long. Everyone asks, will the webinar be archived? Absolutely, it'll be available on investors.com in about 24 hours. And because there's almost 3,000 people live on the webinar, unfortunately we cannot answer all your questions live, but we will do a review of all the webinar questions and answers. It'll be posted on investors.com slash wizards QA. Now all of the ideas, all of the screens, all of the, the charts for today's webinar will be uh, hosted by our product called MarketSmith, which is a comprehensive stock research platform. It can help you find ideas, analyze technical and fundamental data, and more importantly, show you when to buy and sell. And our market wizards are super users of MarketSmith and we'll walk you through how to do it. For those who aren't gonna make it until the end, we wanna let you know there is So, welcome everybody. Hey, this is a, a great day to, uh, for a webinar right here, Stock Market Wizard. He's also written a couple of great books. Trade Like a Stock Market Wizard and think and trade like a champion. Hey, Mark. Uh, how are you doing, Arusha? Good, good. Thanks for joining us in this webinar. Now, our second yep. guest is David Ryan, three-time winner of the U.S. Stock Investing Championship, former client advisor and product developer of William O'Neill & Company, former portfolio manager in-house here, uh, for William O'Neill and also the new USA Growth Fund and also the founder of Ryan Capital Management. Now, Dave, David has been, as you've all heard with the, the California fires, uh, Dave's been affected by that, but he has overcome all odds to, to join us <laughs> today. Uh, so David, thanks so much. Welcome to the webinar. Yeah, Rusha, thank you. It's uh, it's so nice to be on this call, and it, I, I look forward to doing it. It should be a lot of fun. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and get started right here. And so this is what we're going to cover in today's program. We're going to go over and make sense of the current market. Uh, we'll go over how these market wizards trade with an edge, uh, and after that, what you should look for in a stock, what these market wizards look for when they're analyzing stocks. Then we'll go over how to find winning stocks, and then finally we're going to do a live chart breakdown. So let's get started and just go over the current market and, and try to make sense of this because it is a tricky market. So here's a snapshot. I took this snapshot uh, probably a, a, an hour and a half before the close, and it actually rebounded uh, from here. And, and so I, I'm not sure where it goes maybe – maybe halfway on this, but we had a fall today on November 7th, but as we can see, that fall today isn't working very well. Uh, guys, any, any uh, comments on this? Yeah, well, we did have a fall through day, and, you know, the market trading below the 200-day right now and the 50-day in a downtrend on most of the uh, major averages, and then, of course, we had some distribution take place within a few days right after the follow through day. Not on the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ actually, the volume was a little lower, but when you take a look at the NYSE uh, uh, volume compared to the uh, S&P 500 or the, uh, the NYSE index, you'll see that we did have it. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, we're gonna go to lower lows and we're gonna have to go and revisit the uh, February low, but it's uh, certainly uh, a more ominous than if we didn't have a distribution day there. So now we just have to watch and see how the market uh, acts over here in the, in the next, uh, uh, you know, several days and weeks to come here. Yeah, and the other thing I would add is on that follow-through day, you got very, very, I mean, you got lower volume, lower than average daily volume on the S&P 500. You did get a pickup in volume on the NASDAQ, but that was that was a sign that it might fail. You, when you get a follow-through, do you really want a lots of volume and you want it you want it on on all exchanges, so that's that's that, that's a key in, in looking at the follow through day. The other thing to to look at 
is how weak the NASDAQ uh, is, is relative to the S&P 500. It's really been underperforming for about four or five months, so money might be moving elsewhere uh, than and out of the NASDAQ and some of the, the more tech-heavy uh, NASDAQ stocks. Yeah, no, real, quick, Sue, uh, real quick, Sue, real quick, Arusha, just to make a follow-up on Dave's point of two things. One, uh, real, the best follow-through days have real powerful thrust. You like to see... You like to see nine or ten to one or greater up volume versus down volume. If you look at the uh, NYSE volume, we did not get that. Also, as Dave pointed out, uh, the Nasdaq's underperforming. It's heavily weighted in these Fang names, and they're late stage, and it looks like there's a rotation here, and you're probably going to have to look for new leadership going forward. Fang names are probably going to be market performers going forward. Okay, so. Yeah. Let's uh, let, let's go on and and how the market wizards trade trade with eggs. Now he, here's the the thing. Professionals always have a plan. They 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 lay out that plan way before the trade. So you plan your trade, then you trade your plan. And so you're going to see throughout this presentation, uh, these two are always planning at, well ahead of time, not in real time. And so guys, let's let's walk through just some of the basics. Uh, of how you initially uh, plan your trades. Right, so we're gonna always have a precise entry point that we know exactly the price we're going to get in, how far we're gonna maybe you know chase that stock, if, or not chase the stock is a better way to put it, um, not chasing the stock too much beyond a proper buy point. So there's a, you know, a precise uh, a, a trigger that we're going to know and also we're going to know our risk before we ever even get into the trade. Exactly where I'm going to set my stop loss. Dave's the same. You know, he's going to know exactly where he's out before he ever gets in on the risk side. So we're already quantifying that risk. As a matter of fact, I'm going to back into the trade based on that risk. And then, of course, um, you know, you got you have to manage the trade based on your risk versus reward. Yeah, and then. And a lot of this, I, you know, there are times where I track stocks and I've got their entry points set. And it might not happen in the next day or two, but sometimes I'm tracking stocks for weeks or if not months, waiting for that exact setup to to, to happen. So it's not something that you rush in real quickly. It's, it does take planning to set that buy spot and then also immediately or even before you get into the trade to set that spot of where you're going to be getting out. Yeah, and let me just follow up on one thing also. When you're doing your work and you're trying to find these entry points, um, you know, using MarketSmith and doing, you know, conducting your screens. I like to do it the night before when things are calm and quiet. The next day, I have already laid out my plan for the day and what I'm going to be looking at, the stocks that are set up and are ready to move through buy points. The thing that I would really uh, encourage people to uh, avoid is not calling, calling audibles, meaning making a last minute decision. In the middle of the day, you see something on TV, you read a story, and all of a sudden you're making snap decisions that you didn't really do much planning on. That's for the night before, run your market smith screens, get your stocks that are set up, get set the entry points, and then stick to that plan the next day. Don't call, don't call any audibles in the middle of the day. Yeah, and, okay. and what, what that, okay, uh, one last thing, what that does is that eliminates the emotion and that's what you always want to achieve on every in and every out of a, of a stock, is you want to remove the emotional decision. It should be all cut and dried. Exactly. So let's illustrate this concept with, uh, with a trade. Now, now Mark, you, you, you traded this. Uh, this is your trade. All right. And so here's Shake Shack. So now the, the first thing that I wanted to highlight here is uh, pattern recognition. So I'm hovering my mouse over pattern recognition. And so you can see it identifies a cup with handle there, so that U shape green line right there uh, where and then you have a little dip that's pattern recognition that's all computer generated right there that's all on market smith and it automatically just puts it right on the chart for you and so it's really laying out that plan right for you so mark why don't you take us through your thinking uh back then when you saw shake shack setting up this pattern right and market smith did a great job of of uh outlining here a, a, a textbook cup with handle you can also turn that on and off if you don't want to have that pattern recognition you can turn it on and off so but it did a great job of uh, recognizing this so the, the the buy point here is at 4440 as it moves through there that's that's where you want to enter that uh that trade 
Um, and then, of course, my stop was uh, a little bit below uh, the low in that handle there. Uh, it was the, uh, a, a little bit lower than uh, uh, the actual low there. Um, I had a pretty tight stop on it, and the stock just came out of there, you know, perfect. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, a, just a textbook setup, a textbook couple of handle setup. So Mark is buying here. Now here's really the next step that market wizards look at. It's not just buying the stock at this point. It's managing your expectations, understanding how a great stock should behave. So guys, why don't you walk us through, through uh, what you expect after buying the stock? Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah. What, well, Dave, let me let me want to talk about you know being in a profit right away. Yeah. Dave, when I'm t when I'm buying a stock, I my expectations is that my timing is is good is so good that that stock should immediately go up. Um, and my the best stocks that I buy are the ones that I you know, I, I buy and I'm in a profit within minutes, at least by the end of the day and then it just keeps on going. The best stocks are the ones that are almost hard to buy, and they, when they come out of their setups, they come out and they're up and they just take off and go. And the, the ones that really make the big moves usually have, 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 you know, like 11 out of the next 15 days are super strong on big volume and they're just off to the races, and it's hard to fill out the entire position. Yeah, and the key is really to try to determine whether when you get to these buy points and the stock is moving up, to determine whether you have retail buying or, or real institutional buying. And the difference is is that institutions take time to build a position, and they're going to be in there persistently buying it. The stock becomes hard to buy, and you'll, you'll see they get away from you very quickly. If you don't buy it at the right point, very quickly the stock will get away and next thing you know you're looking at it going oh boy I wish I bought that a little bit lower there when it when it broke out now it's up five six percent or so so those tend to be the trades that work out the best but I want to also stress that it doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to happen every time and the trade is a failure if it doesn't because one of the things I see now with with people you know everybody's got a machine gun in their hands now you know they got the cell phones they're just they're over trading um, so you do have to, and we'll talk about that in a second, but you have to give the trade also some room to fluctuate. But the best thing you, you, you can, the best thing that can happen is that trade is at a profit as quickly as possible. Okay, so let's go back to the, the Shake Shack example. So here's Mark buying it, and here's the expectation. This is what you guys expect, right? Up four out of six days on increased volume. Right. I like to see... 70% of the days over in the first week or two be on the upside. So in the very first few days to you know, first week, I start counting the days. So if you look here and you count the days, you've got four out of six days are up. And then I also look at the closes. So I see there's more, be more good closes than bad closes, a lot of closes right up by the high. So that tells you that the stock's acting well. Um, you're gonna get, you get a little pullback here, that's fine. Um, the way you know if it's natural or not is if you see the balance of power is basically, uh, you know, positive. So you're seeing you know, more up days and down days, more good closes than bad close, closes. And then after a, a small pullback, and you got to let the stock pull back. If you're going to hold it for a bigger move, you're going to go through pullbacks. It should get into new high ground fairly soon, usually within a week or two. It's right back into new high ground after a breakout. That tells you that the stock is under some real accumulation, and you want to hold it for a, a bigger move. And yeah, um, the, the other, where Arushan, uh, the other thing I was going to point out too that is even the stock took off and on uh, two days were up big, and then it pulled back for t two days. Look at the volume, how how the volume was lighter than those up days. So just showing you that there was not much profit taking, not much selling, as that stock took off. And the other thing that was, I think, very important to see is that the relative strength line went into new high ground as the stock was going into new high ground, confirming that, that strength. So, so now here's the stock where you're, you're buying at the buy point, you're up 7%. So you have a little bit of cushion going to earnings. One of the questions we always get is, how do you handle earnings? We know earnings are just so volatile these days. Uh, so, Mark, why don't you start us off with this? Well, how, how did you handle this? You know, you're up 7% at this point. So, so I had a cushion on it, so I went into earnings and I, was, and I held into earnings on this one. Now, usually I'm only gonna hold into earnings if I have a cushion 
And that doesn't necessarily mean that I have just a cushion on the stock. Sometimes if I see a lot of stocks are working and I'm having a lot of success and a lot of stocks are reacting well to earnings and maybe I have backlogged some profits and my trading is doing well and I'm up, uh, maybe my account's up 20, 25%, I have some cushion, I, I built, in, built some profits in, I might start holding some, even if I don't have a big cushion, I have a smaller cushion, maybe I'm only up a few percent. But it's certainly if I'm entering from a cash position, for instance, now, you're, you, know, you have a correction, maybe you're in cash, you're gonna come back into the market, I'm gonna be a little more careful. This just happened just the other day, uh, Advanced Auto Parts, AAP, I own the stock, I uh, looked at the indications, it looked like it was going to uh, have a, a swing of 10% uh, in either direction on earnings, and I was, I was, only, uh, I was down actually about 1% on the trade. I decided to just step aside. Stock ended up gapping up 10%. It, it, you know, in hindsight, it would have been uh, good to hold it, but it could have went the other way too. So, right again, if I have a cushion, then I'll hold. In this particular instance, I held it right into earnings here. And so you, you got the nice, the nice jump on on earnings here. So you can see with the green shaded area with Marcus Smith there, identifying it's now 20% where you want to consider taking your profit at this point. Um, and here's the the move, the final move at this time. So setting yourself up for potential moves like this, this is where all that discipline comes from. Yeah, and then I, I sold some into that strength. I don't think it was on that exact day, but a few days later, then sold some uh, a little bit later you know, as the stock moved higher. Uh, using strength for selling, that's uh, another thing that uh, you know, you're going to uh, want to do as a professional. You know, we're looking for to sell into strength, especially if you have if you're moving size. You have to get out when you can get out, not when you want to get out necessarily. Um, and and uh, you know, when the getting is good. And another thing I want to point out that a lot of people forget what the goal of stock trading is. It's not to get the high or the low, because you're you're never going to get the high or the low, or the low. Okay, that's just a fruitless endeavor. The goal is to make more on your winners than you do on your losers and do it over and over to make a decent profit. So when you have a decent gain, when you're up 35% in eight days, 10 days, you, you compound a few of those trades out. You can, you can uh, turn a pretty big uh, profit in a very short period of time. And I can speak, probably speak for Dave here as well as myself. You know, when we won the U.S. Investing Championship, a lot of people say, now how'd you get those big returns and what were you doing? Were you doing anything different than you do now? We didn't have big giant winners. We were compounding trades like this, where you're picking up 20, 30, 40 percent in, in days to weeks. You don't you don't have to do that too many times, and you have yourself a triple digit return. Yeah. The other thing I want to add to that last slide on Shake Shack is that when that stock gapped on earnings, look how huge the volume was, and 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 also look at any time that stock pulled back as it was on its way to seventy dollars a share. You usually had lighter volume, or you, you had lighter volume. The, the red volume is the down volume. You had lighter volume than when it was moving up. Just a, the, the perfect sign of a stock that's acting well. It's always increasing on heavier volume, and it's pulling back on lighter volume. Okay, guys. So let's go. Let's go into a few more winning trades here. Uh, let's start off with Canada Goose ticker symbol G O O S, and uh, so. Here, here's the setup here. You can see pattern recognition picking up uh, a consolidation, but there is a little bit more detail within this. And so, Mark, why don't you walk us through your, the volatility contraction pattern that you're seeing here? Right. So it's sort of become my signature. Uh, you know, the volatility contraction is a characteristic. It's not necessarily. It's not a different pattern per se, but it will be a characteristic of, say, a cup with handle. So I, I saw a lot of people misinterpreting coupled handles, so came up with this VCP concept to be able to have a, another way to explain it so people could you know, determine whether it's a, 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 con, a consolidation that's a, a proper consolidation. So you want to see those, those uh, pullbacks getting tighter and tighter. And on the right side, I like to see them in the single digits. You know, if, if, I don't want to see a 15% uh, handle, if you will. It's a, that's not a pivot. That's still, you know, uh, enough volatility uh, to be considered still in the basing stage. But once you get that pivot point, you get into single digits. Maybe it's five percent. Uh, in this particular instance, you can see it was five percent on the very right. It contracted four or five uh, times. Now, it, now you're getting ready for that stock to be purchased as it moves through 
uh, of the top of that pivot. And you can also see if you look down at the volume, the volume is very, very low in that pivot. And that's what you want to see, a total dry up of volume. I see stock not coming to market anymore. Yeah. And then the, the other thing is a lot of people say, well, how do you, how do you find these stocks? is when I'm going through and I'm looking at hundreds of stocks, especially on the weekend, preparing for the upcoming week of trading, I'm always concentrating and looking at the right side of the chart. I'm always looking for those tight patterns. I don't have to deal with the rest of the chart until I find that something is tightening up on the right side. And remember, all these stocks that we're looking at, also you want to have it in combination with the other you know, O'Neill can swim characteristics, strong earnings, good consistent earnings and things like that. And But always key off of that right side tightness in that chart. Okay, right. so then... And there's, actually, and there's actually a screen. Let me just give you a quick, uh, uh, you know, plug for Marcus Smith because there's a great screen that is a tight area screen where you it'll actually bring up tightness in price. And, and uh, that's something that you can look at very quickly and find a lot of tight, uh, uh, tight price action. So a couple days later then, Mark is buying here as it's crossing the pivot, and uh, then if it pulls back a little bit, Mark, but you're not getting shaken out here. Yeah, so I bought it as it came out. It's pretty pretty textbook, the way it comes out there. And again, see, this is a, a, an instance where, okay, so it, it, it has not followed through right away, okay? So it's contradicting what we were previously saying now, we want to be at a profit right away. Okay, so this pulls in, but I've already set my stop loss. I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, uh, circumvent my stop loss just because the stock comes in a few percent. I'm still going to stick with that. Now, if I start seeing violations piling up, you know, in that, over the next week or two, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, heavy volume on the downside. There's, there's more bad closes than good closes. <laughs> Excuse me. There's uh, more down days than up days, and they start to pile up. I might reduce my position, but again, you got to give stocks some time. You got to give them a little bit of time. Well, and, and I like to see, even if they don't break out right away, so I'm okay with that. Because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of eyes on a name that runs it out real quick and it comes out a little too hot. I'm okay with a quiet breakout, but I want to see it get back into new high ground within the within one to two weeks. That's sort of my time frame, uh, sort of my time stop. If it's not working out in the first few weeks, then I start to question the trade. And then the, a few days later, it, it, it reemerges into new highs, and this is where David's coming into the stock. Yeah, and now the volume yeah. comes in. Right, right, and uh, yeah, and, and it's it's, and I'm not that far. I mean, it's just going into new high ground, and that's uh, and that's fine. You don't you, the farther you get away from the from the buy point, the the heavier your risk gets, and so. You want to be as close to that buy spot as as possibly as possibly as you can, uh, because yeah, if you start getting more than just even a few percent, or I would maybe go as far as five percent, but that would be the absolute limit. Um, is your risk starts increasing, so you want to be right there as it's going through that 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 pivot point. Okay, and so right. now now it starts uh, um, uh, now it starts to yeah. act a little bit better. And, and then you have your kind of first pullback right back to, to the pivot. Now, a lot of people, Mark, you, you mentioned before the machine gun trading. Uh, this is where people are going to start getting shaken out here. Yeah, well, I'll tell you right now, they'll, they'll get shaken out right away when it didn't work out right away. Where I first bought it, comes in for four or five days. That, that's good enough to knock people out nowadays. Everybody's got such a, a small time frame when they're, uh, you know, they're not willing to, to let a stock uh, play out. Remember, your job as a stock trader is to anticipate coming movements and then wait until you're proven right or wrong. That's the, that's the part that people don't understand and, and don't fully appreciate that wait until you're proven right or wrong. So you should already go into the trade knowing where your risk is. So, but what happens is then the stock starts moving around and all of a sudden you forget that you've already made that decision that you were you know, had acceptable risk. If you can't sleep at night and you're getting uh, uh, all nervous about the trade, you're probably trading too large. So we call it uh, the pillow factor, sell down to the sleeping point, right? So you can uh, uh, adjust your, your position size. So that stop loss, that's, you've made that decision already. Now, once the stock starts moving up, 
now you have to start reassessing, and now you're going to start protecting your line, protecting your break-even point, and at some point protecting the profit. But you, you got to give room, you know, got to give stocks a little bit of room to fluctuate. Here, if you count the days here, you'll see uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's like seven out of maybe eight or nine days up. So it's, it's acting perfect. It came only came in for a few days. Remember, I said one week to two weeks. Within one week, it just shoots right back up. Um, volume comes yeah. back in. I mean, it's it's acting perfect. There's nothing wrong with this at this point. Yeah, and you key off that supply and demand. And when the stock pulled back, and this seems to be happening more often in in I mean in the last couple of years, where a stock breaks out and it pulls right back down on top of the previous base, and once it holds and starts turning back up again, that's you can buy that this uh, you know for the first time even there if you miss the initial breakout. But you want to see, make sure that on on that day where it pulled back after it broke out, is it closed? It looks like it closed. Uh, it closed mid range, maybe slightly below mid range, but the volume wasn't as heavy as that first initial breakout day. So, um, and then, and, I mean, if it came back down into the base and it did it on volume, then I would get a little bit nervous and 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 probably be selling my position or selling part of my position. But the fact that it came down and it sat sat on lower volume and then started turning, that was a good test, and the stock should be off, off to the races after that. And so then well, the, let, the stock... Uh, Arusha, is, let, me, oh, Arusha, oh, yeah. let me just give you just a tiny bit more granularity. So another thing, if you notice how the stock, when the stock drifts back, it takes you know five days, maybe this last, this next time, six or seven days, but you see how quickly it gets back at the new high ground? That's what I call tennis ball action. That actually goes back to Bill Berger. So some of you who know, who maybe are my age, will know. Remember Bill Berger. Um, Bill Berger used to say he likes to buy tennis balls and avoid eggs. So this this is tennis ball action, where you reverse very quickly. You're right back at the new high ground. That's another characteristic of a stock that's under accumulation, where it'll drift off four or five days, and then bang, one or two days, it, it makes it all up. Yeah, and I, I would add that the you know, the natural movement of a stock that's in an uptrend is it moves up quickly, pulls back slowly on lighter volume, moves up quickly, pulls back slowly on, on lighter volume, and that happens over and over again. And if you, if you continue to observe that, you stay with the stock. But if the volume starts picking up on the downside, heavier volume on down days, then that starts raising red flags. Yeah. And so, so the stock hits the 20% and then once again, burning time but this one's a little bit better yet you guys have a cushion at, at this point so you you've earned the right to, to go into earnings with more shares right yeah 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 I mean you got you have you but once you're at a decent profit you have options you have a lot of options open up to you in the beginning it's all risk you go into the trade with principal and risk once you're at a profit you have the option you can take you can take your profit all right there and, and nail down a good profit you can sell Part of it and and free roll the other half. Uh, you can move your stop to break even and free roll the whole trade. You have a lot. Your options open up, so that's where you start want to be. You start being creative with what you're uh, how you're managing the position at that point. In the beginning, there's no there's no room for creativity. You you buy the stock, it breaks out. If it hits your stop, you're out. That that's it. Once the stock moves up, then you could be a little creative here. If you wanted to hold it into earnings, you know, the stock's acting great. Again, if you look at the days, count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's like 15 out of maybe 17 or 18. I'm not exact here, but something like that. And the stock is acting really, really well. So that could give you an indication yeah. that you might want to, you know, try to try to hold that for a bigger move. Yeah, and, and, and that, that number of days up. It's just a sign of institutional buying. They're in there every day. They can't get, they can't fill out their position in one day, so they have to buy it over multiple days. And, and that's also a sign of there's probably a number of institutions trying to get that position at the same time, and that's why it's up that many days in a row. And then we exactly. find out why later, right? It has a great earnings gap, and this ends up going up 54%, uh, so to these kind of moves. Right, and now now the move is accelerated and it's too excessive. Now you're looking at and you're starting to see some signs that you should be selling and taking that profit. And this just goes right back. You could just go in, in my latest book. There's a whole section on selling. O'Neill's book will talk about exactly what's happening right here 
where you have your largest day, your largest spread. Usually, once you get that and you're extended, you run up, you climax, you have a climax run like this, you have your largest day, your largest spread. It's not too soon after that that you get at least an intermediate term top. All right. Yeah, so and, and, and yeah, I was going to just add at that top, you'll see that the you got the largest down volume after it hit 66. Sorry, after it hit 68.75, it had one, two, three, three days in a row on the biggest volume that's traded on the downside in at least uh, almost three months. And that was a sign that, hey, maybe things are starting to change. Then the stock started wedging for a, couple, a number of weeks. It, it, see how it, it, the whole thing is now starting to change. It moves down fast, and it takes a long time. It takes one, two, three, almost four weeks to get back what it lost in just three days. That's a sign of change, a sign of maybe the, the position, the stock is starting to top, and you're gonna start a downtrend. Right, the character is now is now shifting to, to looking like it's under distribution as opposed to accumulation. Yeah, exactly. So let's go into one more trade here with uh, Ollie's bargain outlet. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just do the time, we're, we're gonna skip the Burlington story, for, for, we'll save it for another Time. We, we hope to do another. We're, we're going to probably do another webinar uh, next year. But uh, so we'll save that, guys, for for, for the, that next webinar. Let's go into Ollie's, and then then we'll get a little bit further uh, down the line here. So here's Ollie's, uh, and uh, guys, why, why don't you take Mark? Why, why don't you take this out? You see a big couple of handle uh, forming, and actually both of you were were buying at on um, this day as it emerged. Uh, yes. Yeah, so David and I were both watching this this stock for a while. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, when David comes to, uh, uh, to, to my town, I have one near my home, and uh, we've gone and, and looked at Ollie's, but uh, Dave, Dave could tell you some, some more about the uh, fundamentals behind Ollie's. But, yeah, we, we were buying it. I, I started with a half position here. Um, I wanted to see it tighten up a bit more. I thought it could still uh, tighten up, but I wanted to make sure I had some position on it as it started to turn up here. So I bought a half position. Dave bought his full position on the same day. Uh, that I that I bought the half position. Yeah, and, and just and new issues, and there is a new issue screen on um, on MarketSmith, but new issues are usually sometimes the biggest winners. And then um, and you can see this this came out it, it came out in a tough market, and the stock went down initially, but formed a great big base of a, looks like over six months, and then came out into new high ground. Some of those. Some of the best new issues actually come in, come out in tough markets, and that's what this one did. And actually, you know, tightened up on the right side there, and then took off. And look at the huge increase in volume that 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 start that stock had as it was coming out, and how low the volume was when it was drifting off in the handle. Right, and, and a few things to point out, Arusha. Uh, one is that, like Dave said, these can be some of the biggest winners, and the reason is, and I call them magnitude trades these primary bases, your first viable base after a new issue, this is the earliest that you can get on board a company uh, in, in, the, in the life cycle of its, its public life cycle. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the company is a new company. It's just, it's a new stock. For instance, Ali was in business for many years uh, prior. Uh, I will, I'll let Dave, you could tell the story about the, uh, the sales and the store uh, closings, but um, right. You know, this this is this was a company that was around for a long time and had a had a long track record of operating the business very successfully. But this is the earliest that you can get on, uh, unless you had IPO shares. And I never buy a stock on the IPO. I want to see some price action, and I want to I want to get some technical uh, uh, price action before I'm going to buy the stock. A lot, it, Facebook, LinkedIn, a lot of these stocks come public, and they have to have huge corrections and sometimes take years before they're ready to actually. Uh, uh, make their move. Yeah, and in terms of the, the fundamentals that I would add is that I when I, when I want to try when I get to know a company well, I, I have a little bit more staying power in it when it has shakeouts and such. But on one conference call, they talked about how in 30 years they had never closed a store, and to me, to me that tells me they know how to pick locations and they have very very good management, and that gives me the confidence. To, to buy and I mean, stay with a stock for a long period of time. And the great, the great thing about this and other stocks is that other great winners is that you usually have a number of buy points along the move, especially if a move lasts for a, a year and a half or two years. 
you'll get a, you'll get a number of different entries if you miss the initial base. And David, yeah. that's a great segue for the. So I, I just put it the, the move so far for for Ali. Uh, and uh, Mark talked about the magnitude trade, and and you can see this here of 315 percent from the pivot in two years and seven months. So so not bad, and it kept setting multiple times up too. Right. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you had at least uh, you know four opportunities to buy coming out of the base uh, along the way there. So absolutely, this is. Uh, uh, but but of course. You want to you want to look at companies that number one are not are, are newer names. When I say newer names, in the in the last six, seven, eight years, because most of the big winners are companies that haven't been around uh, for more than about eight or ten years. So and also companies that might be unfamiliar to you that you haven't heard of. And everybody just you know knows Amazon and Facebook and Google and Netflix and these are what they want to own. But that's you know, when I was buying Amazon uh, back in '97 and buying Netflix in 2010 and buying Cisco in 1990, you know what? Nobody heard of them. As a matter of fact, most people hated these companies. Everybody hated Amazon for for a long, long period of time. The Wall Street uh, said they'll never make any money. So, and now everybody loves Amazon. It's a, it's like a bellwether. So, you, you got to re realize that at some point, these stocks uh, become uh, uh, you know yesterday's leaders. Okay, so let's move on to cutting losses. And so let's just go over the basics here of, of cutting losses here. So Mark, why, why don't you take us through just why this is so important? Okay, well, first of all, you're gonna have losses. That, that's a guarantee, so you have to deal with them. And at some point, you'll have big losses if you don't take small losses. There is no other way. You know, between David, myself, you know, uh, uh, Bill O'Neill, um, you know, we've got, I don't know how many, you know, years, I've been doing it for 35 years, Dave, over 40 years. We haven't found a better way. You know, if there was a better way, believe me, we'd be doing it. But we haven't found a better way than cutting your loss. And your know, options and hedging and all that, that adds risk. So that's not, that's not mitigating risk. The, the reason why a, a, an 8% number is so important is because at 8%, it basically takes 8% to break even. When you get to 10, it's an 11% move to get even. You get to 20, it's a 25, it's 50, you know, it's 100. So it works geometrically against you. You can never let yourself have a big loss because it takes too much work to get back to even. So uh, keeping those losses at 8% or, or less is very important. Yeah, and I, I would add that any loss that gets greater than 8% is, is caused by rationalization. You start rationalizing the loss. You say, well, I know the company really well, or the CEO lives next door to me, and he says everything's great. And you start coming up with all these reasons why you should stay in the stock. But the number one reason is that stock is at a loss, and the loss is getting worse. And the other thing is that it, and all this takes is discipline and setting that stop loss before you get into the trade. You don't start, as Mark said, calling audibles and, and start doing all sorts of different things, but you set it beforehand and you stick to it so you prevent these losses from getting out of hand. So let's yeah, go on a, a couple of examples here. Uh, so, so Mark, yeah. let's go over a Habit restaurants. And uh, so this is where you were buying it. As it came out here, and um, you know, this was a power play, or what uh, what we refer to, uh, Bill would refer to as a high tight flag. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is what I call a velocity trade. So you have the magnitude trade is the the, the new IPO, the uh, uh, primary base setup, the power plays, the high tight flags. These are the velocity trades, the trades that can move up very quickly in a short period of time. When these work out. You'll generally, if you go back and you take a look at the ones that work out, they go up between one and three percent a day over anywhere between you know 35, 40, 50 days, and, and just in the first few months, and, and can make even much bigger gains. But you'll find that you get rewarded really, really well when they work out. Um, so I'm always considering, uh, you know, the power play setup. Now, in this case, though, it didn't work, right? Like many trades, but you have your plan. Right, so just, just apply the same rationale that I was talking before. So here, it breaks out, next day, tries to follow through, reverses. Now, if you look at the first first week, 
count the days. You've got one, two, you've only got two days out of five or six days up, right? And now, and the stock comes back in, and, and one of the worst things that you can see is uh, relatively low volume out and then high volume in. So meaning that you break out of the base, but then you come back in on higher volume that you came out. The only thing worse than that would be you came out on very low volume, and then you had even really high volume coming in. But even if you have a good volume breakout, if the volume then is larger coming back in, and you can't rally. See, this stock couldn't rally, and you see there's there's a bunch of bad closes. So it's just the exact opposite characteristic as we saw with the uh, situations that worked out. So I'm and, out. And I'm out right there. It comes back in. I'm gone. Yeah, and and so this is why, right? These stocks can get much worse at, at this point. Uh, so David, let's go into your trade here with with Marathon Petroleum. And uh, right. so you saw this couple, couple of handles yeah, forming, uh, and so you're buying yeah. here, and, and so you're just following your plan at this yeah, point. Yeah, and the, the, the thing that uh, this, the, the handle, lots of times when you go back, or most times when you go back on a losing trade, it's because it wasn't properly set up. And the, where I was buying here, it had a handle, but it, it really dropped down a little too much in the handle there. Uh, down to 76.22, and then it comes right back up. But, the, you know, the volume's not great on the breakout. And then about four or five days after the, after the breakout, you start getting bigger volume on the downside. And it, it, you know, it really actually broke out one day and then started, and you started getting distribution. And then it started chopping back and forth, it went into new high ground again through 85, but it can re completely reverse on that one day and also got some huge volume. And so then I gave it some time, but then when it came back down through my buy point and I started taking a loss and out I, out I went. But this is just the opposite of what you want to see on a successful breakout. You want, you want that thing to keep on going for a number of days and not this chop back and forth with heavier volume on the downside. You can also see, Arusha, real quickly, you can see how David gave this stock every opportunity to prove itself right or wrong. And like I was saying before, you know, you don't just jump in and jump out because the stock doesn't perform in the first few days or even the first week or two. So this stock broke out, and then it tried to consolidate it. It had one quick shakeout, zoomed right back at the new high ground. looks like, okay, everything's okay here. And then it starts getting a little volatile and squirrely. It's all over the place, and, 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 and then it starts to act a little bit funny there and comes in and now it's uh it's showing that the volatility is picking up and it's coming down towards his buy point and, and and hitting a stop but but dave's giving it the room he's, he's giving it the room until it's either a profit and he's going to shift to protecting his break even or start protecting his profit uh, he's sticking with that stop and letting the stock have some room to fluctuate yeah okay so let's move through one more stock here this is twitter that that mark traded and we'll move quickly through where Mark bought it. Um, so, yeah, Mark, why don't you just uh, quickly just talk about the, the, what you're seeing here with this, uh, with, with this at this point? Well, another stock that's a power play type setup. I was watching Twitter for a while. It finally got some legs and, and, and moved up, uh, you know, aggressively off the lows there and started setting up like it, uh, uh, like it was setting up a, a power play type, a high type flag setup. So I bought it as it started to come off the lows there a bit. Uh, because it's a, very, a widely followed name. I was trying to buy it uh, as it started to turn up. I actually bought it bought more as it confirmed and, and got strong there on that, that last day there. Yeah. And I took a very large position. I was overweighted in it. Um, so that, those were my buy points there. I scaled into it. And in this case, it doesn't work, right? And so you end up round tripping this trade. And so you have to cut your losses. Right, so there's, there's another example of low volume out, high volume in. And just real quick, you know, the, what I found, you know, dealing with uh, thousands of investors over the years, that the real $64,000 question for most uh, traders, certainly beginning traders, is they spend so much time trying to learn how to get into the stock and buy the stock that once they're in it, they don't know what to do with it. What do I do after the trade starts to work? You know, do I sell it at 10%, 20%? Um, or what if it just sits there and it doesn't do anything? And it's not really hitting my stop, but it's not moving. So in my most recent book, I lay out all the violations and confirmations. I know I talked about a few of them here, but there's 
six or seven of them that I that I look for, and this is one of the main, one of the most ominous uh, violations you can have, and that is where the stock comes out uh, on on either low volume or or volume that is then completely uh, uh, engulfed as the stock comes back in hard into the base, and you can see that's low volume out. I call it low volume out, high volume in. So now you come back in real hard. Big, that's, a, that's the biggest down day and a, and a huge spike in volume. So I'm not going to stick around there. I mean, I'm lucky to get out of there at break even. That's what ended up happening. I ended up breaking even on the trade. But that's, uh, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to get out of there and uh, and, and wait till, uh, till till this clears, the smoke clears. Now, here's one of the coolest things I learned from both of you guys. Uh, you know, when you when both of you guys sell a stock, you don't immediately knock it off your watch list. You put it on another list that you look at still frequently, every day or every few days. Uh, and here's, here's Twitter now, a, a couple months later, setting up a coupled handle and potentially giving another chance to take a shot on it. Yeah, yeah, I know Dave, Dave is, uh, you know, and myself, we both, uh, when we sell a stock, even at a profit or the stock stops us out, we put it on a sold list I, I, and I look at it, you know, regularly, I'll, I'll keep looking at that list because just because the stock stops you out doesn't necessarily mean that the fundamentals have deteriorated. They, the fundamentals might actually improve, and it may take a little more time. You're maybe early into the trade, or it was extended in price and, and needed some time to correct. Maybe the market uh, uh, comes off a bit, and, and it's correcting with the market. So, you know, there's only so many uh, uh, names uh, that you're probably going to be looking at. We're all looking at the same names. All right, there's, but you screen the market and you find maybe there's a few hundred names that have great earnings and great charts. Uh, it all comes down to timing, but uh, I don't, you know, I, I always look for a reset, and this, this was a perfect example where the stock then set up a nice little uh, couple of handle type pattern here. Yeah, I think the other thing that's important about what Mark said is that you should have no ego. You lost money in the stock once, and maybe you lost money in the stock the third time. You shouldn't be sitting there arguing with yourself when it sets up again and say, oh, I hate this company. I've already lost money twice. I'm not playing again. Usually, that's the time the stock really makes the big move, and you're going to miss out. It's when You just have to, again, be disciplined, cut out the emotion, cut out your ego, and take every stock as it sets up. And if it's setting up for the third time and it takes off, you've got to buy it again. That's right. The first, the first step is to be able to recognize uh, what, what I like, how I like to put it is I like to play aces and kings and queens. All right. If you if you use a poker analogy, I want to I want to play aces, kings, and queens. That's a premium hand. So now, does that mean that every time you're going to win with aces? No. All right. It's probabilities though. Over a, over a number of hands, you will win. You will you will win seventy percent of the time if you push all your money in on a on a game of Texas Hold'em pre flop heads up. You're going to win 75% of the time with aces, but you might lose a few times in a row with aces. So, same thing. But first, you have to learn how to spot aces. Once you learn how to spot aces, you should always play aces, even if it's the same stock. If it's setting up, you you, you go back and you have to. Uh, if the stock doesn't know who you are and doesn't have it out for you, I can assure you. <laughs> so, Mark, you you sold it as strength here. I guess another valuable lesson that you know we all have to learn when, when trading. Yeah, so this, I mean, it's acting really good. I mean, you know, if you go and you look at it's got a whole bunch of up days and only, I think, maybe two down days. It's acting great, but the stock is really hyperextended here. So I made a nice, you know, nice quick gain in a very short period of time. I figured at the very least the stock probably is going to have to, you know, maybe rebase a bit. Maybe I can buy it back. A lot of times I'll sell part of my position. So I, I'll, I'll have a nice gain like this. I'll sell half my position. I'll move my stop up and backstop it and then if it resets i'll add back the half that i took off and trade around my core position in this particular instance i just decided to just take the money and run and uh and and hit it just a you know day off the high there okay. yeah and mark one thing that you well, you mentioned that's important is that too many think people think they should be all in on a stock or all out of the stock but we so many times. I mean, almost all the time, we're buying incrementally and also selling incrementally as we're going into a stock because we know we we're just kind of. It's like driving a car. You see, you see a yellow light, you start slowing down. It turns green again. You speed up and you start buying it again as the base is 
complete. So you're constant, uh, constantly adjusting the position for how the stock is acting. Yes, yeah, so many people think in, want to think in black and white. All right, it's, investing is not an on-off business. It's a business of adjustments, of making incremental adjustments. You can, with buying, you don't have to buy all at one price. You can scale in, all right, with, with your stops. You don't have to set a stop at one price. Sometimes I set a staggered stop, what I call staggered stops. So I'll, I might set a stop at, I want to average, I want to have an 8% loss on the trade. Uh, so if I set a 6% and a 10%, I'm going to lose on. I'm going to. I'm going to get stopped out on half my trade at six, half at ten. I end up with my eight percent loss, but I give the second half a little more room. So that's how, the only way I would ever exceed an eight percent stop would be if I'm staggering the stops, but I'm still going to average that eight percent at worst. And also, I just want to point out, you shouldn't average eight percent. Your if your losses should be more in the neighborhood of you know, four, five, or six percent on average. Your worst case scenario is your eight percent stop. That's not, it shouldn't be your average. Okay, so let, let's go into what, what you guys look for in a stock. So David, let's start off with you here first. Uh, so I would pull up a Marcus Smith weekly chart. This is Ollie's bargain outlet. Uh, and so David, why don't you just walk us quickly through just what you look for uh, with this weekly chart and, and just how Canceland's integrated into it. Yeah, it, yeah, remember, the, the canceling philosophy is designed into this chart. So you can go on this one chart and get all the characteristics you need. Down in the left-hand corner, the quarterly earnings, that stands for the C. You can get the annual earnings right above that and a, a few blocks higher showing the earnings per share growth rate. The, the new is, is in the description. You can also see new highs in price as the stock is breaking out. Also, right up at the top of the chart, there's the market capitalization, the shares and the float to see how big the company is. And also, um, also the S stands for supply and demand, and that's just looking at the, the volume uh, in the chart as it's, as it's moving up or as it's moving down. And then leader or laggard, L stands for leader lag. You can see the relative strength on this stock and all he's right there is 97, so it's outperforming. And then I'd also like to point out that the the line right under the chart, the the this blue line, is showing you how strong that stock is against the S&P 500. And then other things that are important is you know the I in Can Slim is the number of funds. What kind of institutional sponsorship is that stock getting? And you can see that the number of funds in this stock over the last four quarters has gone from 434 now up to 517. So, and then M stands, for, M, M stands for market. So the great thing about this, the way it's designed is you've got everything really you need in one chart and you don't have to go looking all over the inter internet for this, this type of information. And yeah, Mark, if I could just follow up, if I could just follow up on that Arusha and yeah. just, just because I need to point out that, you know, Marcus Smith didn't just come to me out of the clear blue here, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, we'll, we'll work with this uh, company and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, start talking about their product. I've been a customer of Marcus Smith and the predecessors, of course, Daily Graphs Online, before that, the Daily Graph printed version, and seen this entire thing just uh, evolve over 30 years. I've been a customer for 30 years. So to, to me, this is a, an absolute necessity. And, and I would point out that the problem now with there's so much information, you have, there's so much, you're, you're, there's information overload now. People have so much information with social media and the internet, but they have too much information. And the beauty about Marcus Smith is that this is the stuff that you need to see is all put on the, the chart here, the relevant data that's important based on fact, not on your opinion and what you think works. This is, this is based on what actually works in the market. So I would you know, tell everybody to just get rid of all their, you know, their free programs and all their stuff that they think, you know, you think you're being cute getting free stuff, but in fact, you know, this is the best money that I've ever spent in my life is having these charts. These, these charts, this uh, Daily Graphs, Daily Graphs Online Market Smith, you know, without it, um, you know, I don't know if I'd be able to do what I've done because I, you just don't get all this information in one place. So, um, and, and we could talk about, you know, how I look at this, uh, you know, break this stuff down also. 
Yeah, so, so Mark, I, yeah, I know you could spend a whole webinar just on this weekly yeah. chart. Uh, so let's, let's go into a few more details that, that you have learned over the years just using the product for over 30 years. Yeah, there's so much data on, on these charts, and it's all you need. You don't need anything more. So uh, one of the things, if you go back, if we back up and we take a look at when Ollie's was actually setting up that perfect IPO base, it was also setting up something that I looked for. I always look, look at the earnings, the annual earnings. You can look at it on the weekly chart here. You'll see in that box on the left-hand side there's, there's the annual earnings. I always look to see if there's been a range that the earnings have been stuck in in three, four, five years or more. And if you're going to break out of that range, now sometimes you already see the breakout. In this particular instance, you'll see 29 cents, 33 cents, 33 cents in 2012, 13, and 14. And then 15, it breaks out, 40, 47 cents. So what's that, about 40? Actually, that's about 40. I think it was like 42%, uh, 40, Mark, yeah. yeah. 42%. So you've got a 42%. That, that's a very significant earnings breakout. And institutions will key in on that. They have their computers set for earnings surprises, and they, they use regression. And when they break out of these ranges, they'll start looking at this. The difference is, is that as an individual, you have a speedboat, and the institutions are they're, they're running a cruise ship. It takes a long time for them to take these positions, and you can benefit from that because you have the, the ability to move very quickly on these, and you can see it right away. So you can see you get a breakout. This is what I call a breakout year. You get a breakout year here. And you see the earnings break out, and, they, and since then they've been accelerating. And sometimes you get, you'll just see that there'll be an estimate of a breakout year. And that's enough for, to get my attention to start watching the quarterlies and to see if that's coming to fruition. So maybe 2015, 47 cents is the estimate. But that's showing that they're expected to ha have a breakout year. So now that's going to come on my radar. So that was one of the, one of the things that I was looking at back then. Now, a few other things, uh, the top five relative trend stocks right there on the weekly chart. Yeah, so I'm yeah, always I was, looking I was, at the other. But, but, yeah, go ahead. You talk about it, uh, Dave. Yeah, I would just say that when you're looking at a group or you're looking at a stock, it's always good to see what are the other stocks in the group. And this shows you the, the top five stocks. And I would concentrate on those top two or three at the most. Don't start going all the way down to the bottom of the group and look at something that has a very poor relative strength or poor earnings because that is probably not going to make it's probably not going to catch up to the leader in the group and so the leader in this group is either Ollie or five below. I mean Dollar General is, has done very well too, but these are the two that have made really the biggest moves over the last couple of years, and that's where you want to do your constant and you want to concentrate on getting into those those types of stocks. And you might find you might find a name that's even even a better name. You might find that maybe you've uh, uncovered a name, and you look at the top few relative strength names, and there's a name that even has more powerful characteristics. And then we have exactly. fourth on the quarterly earnings and sales. But let's skip that for one second, since we already covered that. Let's go to timeliness rating. Mark, uh, you had a great way to, to to express this one and why this is important to you. Okay, so I've been. I've been using the product for 30 years, and what I've found over 30 years is that virtually every bear market that I've seen, I think I've been through eight, or eight bear markets now, virtually every bear market that I've seen, the, the, the leading stocks that, in hindsight, that I saw lead the market, almost every one of them have timeliness ratings of A when they emerge. It, it's, it's a great thing to look at. That's, that list alone, just looking at the A timeliness rating stocks, when you're in a correction, is is a is a great uh, list right there in itself. It'll bring up anywhere between I think 250 to maybe 400 names. Um, right now, you know, you could be running that timeliness rating A and looking for stocks coming out of bases, and that's going to put you that's going to put you ahead of 98% of every other other investor right there because it's going to have the characteristics of big winning stocks. It's not going to guarantee your success, but this is a game of probabilities. And, you, and that's going to put you in the right direction. At least you'll be in the right direction looking at the, a, a qualified list of stocks. And so, so now after you find a, a stock that's acting well, uh, Mark, why don't you walk us through, you know, that you mentioned the industry groups, finding some uh, ideas. Why don't you just walk us through how you use MarketSmith uh, to do that by uh, using the related information panel? Right, so once I, once I 
find some ideas. Uh, you know, maybe I, I find this, you know, Ollie's, and I look at the top stocks. Well, sometimes there's, you know, the group is a large group, something like maybe a semiconductor has a lot of stocks in the group. Um, I like to use the panel on the right, the industry and sectors, and then you'll see it says view stocks and industry. You click on that, and all the stocks in that industry group will come up, and then it will populate the, the, the screening. I, I'm not sure what you call it on the bottom, but you'll see all those names. And then what I do is I, I can sort them. I can sort them by relative strength. I want to sort them by your composite rating or by earnings, uh, maybe uh, how close they are to a 52-week high. I can sort those and then start looking at the better names. And that gives me an idea of what's going on with, with the entire group. Um, and so I, I love that feature. It's a, it's a great feature to go even beyond the, the top five stock window. And so now let's take this going a little bit further here, because in the last six months, you know, we, we've had a chance to, to work with Mark on improving and, and really incorporating uh, his trend template. Uh, we always heard, uh, we always got requests from customers, hey, do you have Mark Minervini's trend template? And, and so this was our opportunity. So we, we've been working with Mark for a number of months now, refining and, and really getting these trend templates, uh, uh, finding the stocks that he's looking for here. So Mark. What we, right now we have two ten templates. We have the five month and the one month. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to introduce another one that's a little bit looser that gives you a little bit more flexibility. But Mark, why don't you walk us through the the five month and the one month? All right. So some of you that have read my first book will understand about stage two uptrend and that I, I'm looking for uh, uh, stocks that are already in uptrend. So I'm not looking to buy the the bottom in a, in a stock. I'm trying to find the stocks that are already in uptrends and have some momentum behind them. So this is what I call non-negotiable criteria. And up until this point, you weren't able to calculate this in any one place. You would have, you, you, even at MarketSmith, you weren't able to calculate it. Um, so they've, made, they've added those variables in here where you can run a screen and you're gonna right away, it's gonna meet the eight criteria that I'm looking for that the stock is in what I call the stage two uptrend. Any stock that doesn't make this cut, I'm not even going to see. So, you know, it, it's a great for discipline because you might be tempted to buy some stock because, you know, it's a big cap name, GE, for instance. I know a lot of people on Twitter are telling me, oh, my God, aren't you tempted to buy, you know, GE at, at $7 or $6? No, I'm not. It doesn't, it, it would, I would never even see it unless, you know, people, uh, if it wasn't on TV, I'm not going to see it on my screen. So the five month sample is, a ten, trend template is simply looking at, at the um, uh, a confirmed uptrend of five months, and that's pretty much 98% of all my trades are going to be uh, are going to have the uh, this criteria. And then the one month trend template, Mark. So the one month trend template is simply the uptrend is just starting to turn up. If you want to try to uh, maybe get a, a little head start and see uh, um, this works good with bigger cap names, also with the power plays and the high tight flags, because sometimes they just take right off off the lows and they run up really quickly and but they set up before the longer term trend gets a chance to really get itself uh, uh, confirmed over four or five months. Um, so this is another uh, a shorter time frame uh, trend template. And again, most of you know the trades that I make are going to be on the five month, but this is a good one to run also to look for those uh, those what I call an early turn. Okay, so let's go over how, how to find these. Here's your marksman chart. You want to go in the bottom panel, and then either you can click on the middle bar, uh, the middle button right there, the half white, half black icon, or the, the black icon, and you're going to open up that list panel. And then it's really easy from here. When you look to the left-hand side, all you have to do is click on report, stock, technical, and then there are your two trend templates, the one month and then the five months. So once you click on one of these reports, these are all auto-generated for you. Uh, the stocks are going to appear uh, in, in that bottom panel right there. Uh, so, Mark, now there's one other really cool thing that you can do here. You have that five-month trend template. Uh, when I took this screenshot, it was like 221 stocks, but you can actually also screen off of this trend template. Can you walk us through that? Right. So when you're when you're screening in MarketSmith, you're you're screening from the MarketSmith database, which is you know thousands of companies. But you can narrow that down if you want to use the trend template. That could be your qualifier, what I call non-negotiable criteria. If it doesn't meet that criteria, I'm not going to trade the stock. 
So I don't want to see anything unless it's in an uptrend. You can add the timeliness ranking if you want and look at those A, those A stocks that are within the, uh, in those uptrends. So you would go up to the left-hand corner, select the trend template, and that would be the, the database that you would be screening from. So it would already screen everything out, and, and now you're going to add that criteria. Maybe you're going to add some earnings criteria or some other type criteria or increase the relative strength. Maybe you want to only look at uh, relative strength number of uh, you know, 85 and higher. So you can add that and now start narrowing it down. This helps you to narrow a list, uh, you know, a very large list of companies in a universe down to a very manageable number of names. And so, yeah, you can see here, I just added the, the EPS percent change of 20% when we dropped it down from 221 to 99. So let's go over a, another uh, way to screen with Mark. It's been so, David, you, you love, well, both of you love using this, but let, David, why don't you walk us through the, the relative strength line new high? It, 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 it's pretty simple right here, but it's very, very important. Yeah, the <clears throat> relative strength new highs is it's actually looking at the relative strength line, and that's, that line is versus the S&P 500. And when the market is in a real bad downtrend, I mean, like, this is a great market to use this screen, is that when the stocks that are holding that that relative strength excuse me that relative strength line will be hitting new highs and so you i do this almost on a daily basis when we're in a market like this looking for those companies and even the sectors too that are holding well because those are going to be the ones when the weight of the market comes off and it starts turning higher those are usually the ones that are going to take off and 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 make the, the next big move now, you might find utilities showing up there. Those I wouldn't consider as great candidates. But if you start seeing some growth stocks starting to show up there, names that you haven't recognized in the past that are showing up, start checking into them. Look at their earnings. Go through all the canceling characteristics because that could be the greatest. The, those could be the big winners in the next, uh, in the next bull market. Yeah, I particularly like to use the RS line new high a screening function during corrections because yeah the, the market can be going down and a stock could just be going sideways and it's increasing its relative strength and you you want to know which stocks are resisting those could be the leaders you know when, when they finally break out so this is very easy a little box you just check it and it'll 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 narrow down uh, it'll it'll uh, uh, require that your stocks have to have a relative strength line hitting new highs. I wouldn't use this exclusively always, but it, particularly in a correction, it's a, it's a very good uh, thing to look at. Okay, and so then one more list here. Uh, the near pivot list is a really, really popular list for those who don't have as much time. Uh, just quickly to walk through this one, all you have to do is click on the stock ideas button, uh, and this little window's gonna appear, and when you click on view, the stocks will appear on the bottom. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to show all the stocks within our Market Smith Grill 250 list uh, setting up, all that are picking up patterns right now. And, and a number of those, they might have these uh, cheat areas that Mark likes to look at or maybe pullbacks and, and, and things like that. So this is a great list. If you don't have as much time, you can go from 300 stocks right down to the, the most critical ones right now, 24 stocks. In, in the in the list, so it's real easy. We're using that pattern recognition technology to make things a lot quicker for all of us. Yes, and doing a very good job of it. And you're starting with an already qualified list of the Market Smith 250, which is already going to put you in a direction of having uh, a, a lot of the characteristics over, already in place. And then this is going to give you the ones that are technically uh, setting up. So a, a great list to look at on a regular basis. Okay, so let's get into some live chart breakdowns here. So we ran the screens over the last couple of days. And so, guys, let's just go over a, a few ideas here um, of what, what you're seeing here. And, let, and so the first one we have is Fog Below. Yeah. Go ahead, um, Mark, on this one, yeah. Yeah, I don't see the chart, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, it, it should come up now. Did it, did it come up? I don't see it, no. It just says live chart breakdown. But that's okay because I actually have on my screen next to me I have uh, Market Smith. 
<laughs> I, I can I, I know what it looks like anyway. So so yeah. So if I you know the retail area, it's sort of fragmented a little bit. I was I was early into the retail area back I don't know maybe six eight twelve months ago, um, and and since then retail's you know done quite well. It seems like it's getting a little bit fragmented. Today we had a few of the names. Uh, you had uh, Nordstrom, uh, Kohl's, Target. Uh, took it a little hard today. So it looks like the bigger retailers are starting to underperform a bit, but the the uh, discount retailers like uh, Dollar General, uh, Five, and Aldi, which we talked about, seem to still be holding up and setting up here. So uh, Five is setting up. You know, there's a there's a look like a viable pivot here that's uh, very close to uh, being a you know being a, a buy candidate. Yeah. And then on the next one, Sienna, this is a, a very interesting, especially when technology is breaking down badly. This is something that's underperformed the market for a long time, and then recently it got a very good earnings report, broke broke out of a nice base, looks like it's pulling back on a little bit lighter volume, and that's, that's something to watch to see if it, if it sets up a, another base right in here. But it's kind of bucking the trend, and that uh, gets me a little bit nervous since there's a lot of money coming out of a lot of other technology stocks. Yeah, yeah, this is, and this is, again, you can see the 200 days just only been in an uptrend for about, you know, four or five months. So this would get picked up on that trend template. And uh, just coming out of this base here, had a nice big move on the earnings. You see that right there, there's like 20 million shares. And as, uh, as Bill would say, that's not your Aunt Betty. Um, th those, are, those are institutions piling in there. So now, uh, through the correction, as we corrected here, this stock held up pretty good, and it's one of the very first to rip into new high ground here. So I would even be willing maybe to buy, as this is pulling back here, back near the breakout, buy it as it starts to turn back up. You would look for that, that tennis ball action that I'm talking about. And if it doesn't materialize and it keeps drifting off, then you know, I would get out of it and cut my loss. But it should find support fairly soon. Um, I, it's acting, it's acting really well. Yeah. Oh, well, DG, of course. Yeah. Let, yep, let's go to. Go let's actually jump to Burlington. You guys had a lot to say about this one. Yeah, you can't see. It. <laughs> you can't see that here um, right now uh, on this chart, but because it doesn't have today's data. But it tried to come out into new high ground today, but pulled all the way back in. Uh, and close right on the low. So again, it, you know, there, it looks like the retailers got a little heavy today, uh, but this one, uh, you know, has all the characteristics. It has made a, a fairly good move though uh, since the uh, the IPO base. We don't have time to talk about that, but uh, I, I was buying it off the IPO base. Yeah, the the thing about this and and the fact that it reversed today is very characteristic of very tough markets. But as long as this uh, it holds up, doesn't break down, continues to form bases, this could be a candidate of when, if, if and when the market starts turning, that this could be a, a leading stock. Now, it's had a long run over the last couple of years, but it, uh, the way it's setting up, uh, it looks like it wants to have another move. The, the other thing that you'll see down at the, the lower part of the chart is that the earnings are actually due in seven days. So you have to be careful buying this heading yeah. right into earnings. Uh, and because yeah. you, they, you're not going to have any cushion unless the stock takes off in the next few days. And, and Arusha, look at the numbers. EPS ranking 99, Group Relative, relative Strength rating A, SMR ranking A, Cumulation Distribution A minus, Composite oh. 99, Timeliness A. I mean, it can't get any better. So it, it nope. meets all the criteria. Now it's just a matter of whether it, it's sustainable or not, and whether you're going to get a buy point. Yeah. Uh, let, let's move so then, through a couple more. Uh, let, let's go to Microsoft, guys. Uh, this one was also looking pretty interesting. Yeah, I would. Yeah, Microsoft. It, yeah, look, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. yeah well, I would say that that um, this is, you know, again another technology stock that's that's starting to have some problems. Look at how large the volume is as the stock has come down uh, since the beginning of October, rallied back up through its 50-day, and now then rolled over again. And it looks like the volume has picked up two days in a row. So I would this I would be very careful of this. It's it it hasn't completely broken down, but it's having now, where the stock has been above the 50-day for the last six months, is now looking like it's starting to live below it. Still above the 200-day, so the longer-term trend is still up, but it might be starting to starting a topping out formation here. 
Yeah, I'm a little bit more positive on this particular stock, and I'll tell you why. But now, again, I'm not. I'm not. I still have to see it shape up here. It's definitely. It, it's getting close to D-Day here with this name. If it starts breaking down from here, it's going to look ominous. But you, we don't have a weekly to look close. But the weekly well, it well, closes up in the upper. Yeah, you can't really see it there, but there's closes in the upper range on the weeklies. Uh, so it looks like, and it's the first time it's pulled back to the 200 day since it came out of a large base. So this one is, to me, is one of the fang type names, if you will, um, that has held up pretty much, you know, better than any other names. It's corrected just about the same uh, uh, percentage wise uh, with the market. So I still want to see it set up here on the right side. I actually own a little bit of this right now, uh, but we'll see uh, uh, if, if it doesn't work out here, start coming off, I'll just get out of it. Okay, guys, it looks like we are running out of time here. Uh, so, so we wanted to get Jonathan, bring Jonathan back on to the webinar. So you've seen the, the, the Wizards of Wall Street show you the impact and power of how they use uh, Mark Smith. If you want to take advantage of this same tool, and remember, it's four weeks for $24.95. Give us a call, 800-831-2525, or go to investors.com slash wizard. That's four weeks of Mark Smith for $24.95. That's over $120 in savings. And you've heard both Mark and David talk about how powerful it is and how it helped them in their career. So give it a shot. Give it a try for a month. So some final thoughts. We had uh, over a thousand questions. There's a lot of questions. We did our best to answer as much as we can. But the webinar will be archived on Investors.com by tomorrow. And we will post all the questions and all the answers on Investors.com slash WizardsQA. So if any questions or, or concerns, give us a call, 800-831-2525. Gentlemen, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah. Well, I final thoughts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go, go, go ahead, ahead, Mark. Well, I just, uh, it was good to be here and I uh, wish we had more time, but it, I think we uh, we did a good job of uh, giving some of the, the highlights of some of the uh, the great uh, uh, tools that we have here to use with Marco Smith. Of course, the program is much deeper than what we went into. Um, and it's just a very powerful tool. And you guys already know how much I love it. So uh, it was great to be here. And I wish everybody the best of luck. Yeah, and uh, I would add to that. Yeah, this is, to me, I, I wouldn't be able to invest in the market if I didn't have this product because it just gives me all I have, all I need in a very quick snapshot. And, um, and the last thing I would like to add to, to your knowledge of the markets is that study your mistakes. That's, the, that's where you're going to learn the most. If you, just, if you do a post-analysis on the stocks that you've bought and, the, and sold, and the, especially the ones that you've lost on, that do an analysis and see where you went wrong. And that's where you'll probably improve your, your investment results dramatically. And, and I hope Mark has a, has a good time tonight answering all 1,000 of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you both for taking the time out of your uh, very busy schedule to help educate our, our clients. I, I know I took two pages of notes on the call, and I can't wait to go home and watch, watch it again to learn. So thank you, uh, gentlemen, for taking the time, and hopefully we'll do this again. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great okay. Happy okay, thank care. you very much. Okay, bye-bye.